Hello. The lecture today concerns Civil Liberties, Chapter 5 in your textbook. The material is, uh, there's a lot of material here. And uh, the lecture we're going over here uh, augments your textbook. Your textbook, I think, goes over the material pretty well, um, pretty thoroughly. Do you make sure that you're be reading that as well. This the lectures are intended as uh, a piece that augments or adds to the material that you're getting in the textbook. So, civil liberty is perhaps the first thing that we should go over is this, the idea that the idea of civil liberties begins. Um, actually predates the writing of the Constitution because um, the one of the objections that was raised to the Constitution when it was originally put before the states for ratification was the people who had were voting on this thought that the Constitution as written did not explicitly protect civil liberties enough, did not protect them explicitly. So the, uh, the people who had written the Constitution, the so-called framers of the Constitution, their point of view was that, in fact, the protection of civil liberties was inherent in the actual text of the Constitution. So. The, there's a little confusion, you'd be definitely forgiven for forgetting civil liberties and civil rights confused. I think part of it has to do with uh, when we talk about the Constitution, we talk about the Bill of Rights, and the Bill of Rights actually is much more concerned with civil liberties than it is civil rights. <laughs> so when we talk about, when people talk about, you know, freedom of speech um, or freedom of religion, these, these are uh, freedoms that are protected explicitly in the Bill of Rights, but they we call them civil liberties. So if you can kind of, I hope that will help you keep keep that straight. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, the uh, framers of the Constitution were not so concerned with civil rights. They weren't, well, you know, we have the whole issue, the, the uh, contradiction of slavery. All men are created equal, except for slaves and, of course, women. And Native Americans, um, but in general, the framers were more concerned with civil liberties. And if you think about it, it there's actually there's there's some sense to this too, aside from the fact that, that you had a, a society that was profoundly not equal. Um, but the idea, if you think about like, well, how do people advocate for um, civil rights? How did they protest? How did, how did we get to um, integrated schools and integrated lunch counters? Well, that was people using their civil liberties. In other words, we can use our civil liberties to push for more civil rights or for, for, for more equality, more fairness in our treatment. So there is a, a distinct difference between civil liberties and civil rights when we talk about them, and yet, of course, they are connected. Um, so the um, 14th Amendment is key 
when we talk about modern civil liberties, of course, the 14th Amendment doesn't come until um, the, as a civil war is um, or as, as sort of a consequence of the civil war. Um, but the um, 14th Amendment essentially provides a legal mechanism to bring these civil liberties down to the level where they are applied to every citizen. It doesn't matter where you live, whether you live in Alabama or Vermont, you have certain civil liberties um, that the um, local governments and the state governments have to protect. Now, this is a relatively new concept. This was not the way the 14th Amendment was originally interpreted, despite the wording of the amendment, right? It says, no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the laws. That's what it says, but it wasn't applied to the states really um, for decades. You know, the process of applying the law the protection of, of civil liberties to state and local governments is this process we call selective incorporation. Selective incorporation uh, is a, you might think it's a cumbersome process, you might think it's sort of strange, um, be forgiven for, for having that opinion. Um, it's the process by which, through the Supreme Court, the protection of civil liberties are brought down to the state and local level. So in other words, as it was originally interpreted, we have these protections, let's just say the uh, protection of uh, the freedom of speech, that Congress shall make no law to abridge the freedom of speech of individuals. So the original idea was the federal government could not abridge your freedom of speech or your religion. But state or local governments could. So if you think about it, it's kind of, it's kind of um, a little backwards, right? Because in fact, uh, most of us don't interact with the federal government very often. That's not um, the the level of government that you're normally interacting with. You know, I paid my uh, water bill today. Um, I didn't pay it to the federal government. I paid it to the town where I live. Um, it's this type of um, relationship that is more normal. So states and localities did, in fact, <laughs> limit, uh, you know, pass laws that limited um, freedom of speech and other uh, what we would call civil liberties. So this process begins with the uh, this process of selective incorporation. It begins with the First Amendment. Um, and has continued, actually, there are some people who would say that it began in the late 1800s with um, some cases that um, had to do with uh, um, the railroads, but I don't want to contradict the, the textbook. So your, your textbook has, you know, understandably, we talk about uh, Muir versus Minnesota for example, in, in 1925. Um, so, as I mentioned, in 1897, we had this, you know, uh, protection that is recognized by the Supreme Court. Now, you might, you know, it's sort of interesting that this is where it's first recognized, and, and this is a case where um, there's 
big entities involved and that cannot clearly advocate for themselves um, at the Supreme Court, whereas most individuals are more at a disadvantage. Um, some of these uh, criminal law, civil liberties, um, are again, relatively recent, and some of you might be familiar with a few of these cases from your um, ADJ courses or um, MAP versus Ohio is, is you know, the case about you know, that we need to have a search warrant that is specific um, before we go um, busting into people's houses to uh, find evidence. Um, the right to privacy. This is this is sort of an interesting and um, controversial. Um, it comes up in Griswold versus Connecticut. Um, again, notice this is at the state level, right? The state of, of Connecticut was out, outlawed the um, use, possession of um, contraceptives, um, even by married couples, okay? Um, and uh, Griswold, which was um, the the plaintiff was associated with with Planned Parenthood, um, purposely, you know, uh, arranged this to be a, a test case. Uh, when it went to the Supreme Court, the justices were uh, stumped in some sense, because when you read the Constitution, you will not find this right to privacy, right? You won't, you won't, I challenge you to look for a, a right of, of privacy. It's not explicitly mentioned, but the, the justices uh, found that it was implied. It was um, by the nature of the First, Third, Ninth Amendment, that this idea of having a private sphere of action is strongly implied. Right? So a penumbra means this sort of half darkness of, of uh, this implication is implied. Roe v. Wade, 1973, key case you need to know. Um, this really has pretty big political implications. Um, it um, sort of, uh, there are, although there are those who think that it really should not be part of the whole political sphere, um, nonetheless, um, 73 Supreme Court rules that women have the right to an abortion, the right to terminate a pregnancy. Um, the decision itself is framed as establishes a sort of a a, uh, a framework of um, trimesters so we have certain things that are that are permitted in the first trimester and basically a, and a freedom from unreasonable interference with limits on the uh, abortion um, second trimester is more restricted and finally third trimester it is um, quite restricted. Um, I include this map just to show you just how um, how important this decision was in changing the landscape. Uh, so in most of the country, abortion was just flat out illegal. So we have women, it's not that abortions didn't occur, obviously, but they occurred um, frequently at home or in um, you know, in, in uh, they were performed by people who were not medically qualified to perform them um, and endangering the life of a woman. So, um, in certain parts of the country, they were the right of a woman through an abortion was uh, limited to cases of protecting the health of a woman, or in case of rape or incest. And only in four states was abortion legal. Um, this decision 
you know, it's restricted over time by the first case that comes up that restricts the decision is the case of Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Um, this um, Planned Parenthood versus Casey establishes um, a judicial standard rather than a um, judicial rule. So the standard is, is more um, a, a, a more flexible approach. Put it that way. And so because of this more flexible approach, the states have put on restrictions that include ultrasound imaging, mandatory counseling. Some of these have, have uh, uh, up, uh, have been upheld by the courts and some have not. Um, but in general, we have this trend towards more restrictions. Another implication we talk about the uh, going back to Griswold versus Connecticut is the um, about privacy is privacy as far as sexuality. Um, we have a case where the Supreme Court reversed itself. Um, in '86, the court had upheld uh, anti-sodomy law in, in Georgia. Um, 2003, it it finds that uh, similar laws in Texas were unconstitutional. So Lawrence v. Texas, we have the right to the, the, the Supreme Court upholding the right of uh, same-sex couples to engage in sexual conduct. Again, the, the idea of keeping the government out of the bedroom. Um, the implication of this, of this decision, even at the time, people were saying, well, where does this go? Are these, is gay marriage going to be become legal? Well, not too long after, we do get the Massachusetts Supreme Court, Supreme Judicial Court, uh, ruling that uh, same-sex couples can marry. There's a, there's a whole back and forth and, and other courts, other state courts wrangling with this. But we end up with Obergefell versus Hodges, where the Supreme Court essentially upholds the um, same-sex marriage. Um, now, when we talk about freedom of religion, again, First Amendment, there are two main parts, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. They are pretty much what they sound like. So, Establishment Clause is the government cannot establish a religion. The Government also cannot interfere with your practice of religion, the free exercise clause. So they're related, but they're distinct. Um, and this whole concept has been somewhat controversial from the very beginning, right? So we have differences of opinion, even within the framers of the Constitution. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, very much a believer in, in uh, you know, freedom from religion. Um, that, that we need this real um, wall of separation that, that separates the government from people's religious practices. Um, if you look at the background of this country, it, it kind of sheds some light on that, right? We have people from very distinct religious traditions coming in and establishing this country. and, and um, they all weren't going to agree on religion, that's for sure. Um, so um, within, as it's been interpreted uh, over the years, there's bit contradictions, right? If you look at your currency, you will find, in God we trust, um, you will find, um, you know, God bless America is, is, is what every politician will say, you know, um, in the um, any sort of important speech, right? Um, that said, um, there is this recognition that you know we have a, a First Amendment, and that means that that government should not be involved in religion and should not be established a religion at all, including any any belief of God, right? So this is there's nothing about um, you know this is not established. The United States is not established as a Christian nation any you know in, in any sense um, legally so um, the court 
has wrestled with this over the years. There's, there's some contradictions. We have the court basically ruling that, you know, we have uh, schools cannot start the day with a, a uh, day of prayer. We have the court establishing what is called the lemon test uh, in, in 1971. It has nothing to do with the fruit. It has to do with lemon re B. Kurtzman. It essentially was a local government indirectly subsidizing a parochial school. Now, the idea is if it's a government paying taxes, then the, the government should not be involved in, in any sense supporting any religion. So this is something that is wrestled with again and again. So um, We also have the court establishing a balancing test um, back in, in 63. So you have these the court attempting to establish rules or tests or, or ways to come to a decision, ways to decide is a law constitutional or not. Um, the um, test that is more or less operative right now, the neutrality test, is that um, the law cannot target one religious group and that the law has to be applied to everyone. Um, one of the cases that the Supreme Court had to wrestle with involved the um, use of peyote out by a Native American, a Native American uh, ceremony out in Oregon, and the court um, ruled that, basically ruled against the peyote user, somewhat ironically. Um, religious conservatives were concerned about this, and and uh, lobbied for the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993. Um, this is a uh, law that was came up for review by the, by the Supreme Court, um, and the Supreme Court effectively upheld it. Um, so it, it basically rules, as I put in the previous slide here, that, that the uh, businesses are exempted from a law that applies to everyone when it interfered with the company owner's free exercise of religion. So this is, you know, you can expect that this is a, a subject that will continue to get litigated all the way up to the Supreme Court. Freedom of speech, First Amendment, very important. This is, there's people who say this is, there's a reason why this is a First Amendment, that this as an essential freedom, if there is any freedom that is that must be protected uh, from our, with our civil liberties, it is this freedom of speech. Because if we don't have freedom of speech, how do we have democracy? Um, there are that said, there are limits, obviously, right? So you don't every every civil liberty has limits. You don't have a right to sing happy birthday at 2 o'clock in the morning in a me with a megaphone in downtown Hagerstown. Um, that said, um, a lot of latitude is given for freedom of speech. Government cannot impose prior restraint. There's a, a phrase you need to know. Um, the government is attempted to do this sometimes, uh, but the court has ruled quite uh, consistently that prior restraint is prohibited so government cannot speak stop speech before it occurs just because it thinks something might be dangerous or offensive or whatever they really have to have a strong case um, this comes up in uh, near versus Minnesota this is probably where it's first really um, explicitly dealt with um, there was a publication that was a scurrilous newspaper um, it was libelous, it was um, anti-Semitic, and uh, local state officials tried to um, stop its publication. Um, there's a copy of it, the Saturday Press. Um, and the Supreme Court ruled with the uh, newspaper publisher, uh, near, that is. Uh, also, the Pentagon Papers, this is uh, Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg was the guy who leaked the papers to the New York Times, um, 1971, the Supreme Court ruled with Ellsberg that the, uh, the papers did not endanger 
U.S. security, and that it was just, uh, they were embarrassing to the government because it effectively showed that the government had lied to the American people for decades, going back to Truman. Um, but it was not, nothing that was endangering U.S. security. So um, the Supreme Court ruled that, that it was essential that uh, government, the U.S. government, not be allowed to engage in, in uh, prior restraint and stop them from being published. Now, after something is published, if there is a good case to sue for libel, then, then the courts will entertain that. But that's a separate matter, right? Um, libel is not protected by freedom of speech. Obscenity is not protected. Uh, fighting words are not protected. Um, the case of, uh, when we talk about libel, um, the key case to remember is New York Times versus Sullivan, 1964. Uh, this establishes the actual malice standard. Um, this effectively means that if it's a there's a number of different implications, but if, if you're a public official, um, the standards by which you are being judged as far as your ability to bring a libel claim are more restricted than if you're a private individual. That there is a certain matter of uh, a certain amount of latitude that is given when it's issues of uh, public policy. In this case, uh, Sullivan was a, a law enforcement official from the South. There was an advertisement that was placed in the New York Times that um, basically said that there there was some gross injustice happening with law enforcement uh, in the South as they repressed and attacked civil rights um, protesters. Um, he sued for libel, even though uh, the, um, the 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 bulk of the advertisement was was factual, but there were some a few factual errors, minor factual errors, and the court ruled that that there was no actual malice. Now, notice it was an advertisement. This was not an article that was being published. This is, I think, a, a point that people don't necessarily get. But if you are publishing a newspaper, you are responsible for everything in that newspaper, even if it's an advertisement. Um, so this is an important case you ever owned a newspaper, which is unlikely given the state of newspapers, but um, that you are you are taking responsibility for everything in that newspaper, including advertisements. So um, unprotected speech, as I said, um, fighting words, obscenity, and libel. Um, fighting words, are just a little bit about that. They're kind of a weird um, phrase. This comes from. The verbiage comes from the Supreme Court itself. Um, it um, it basically is saying words that are deliberately provocative have no public policy content. They're not nothing constructive. Uh, in Cohen versus California, have the court ruling on a case where a uh, a man was wearing a jacket with a uh, obscene phrase on it in a, a courthouse, and he was arrested for that. And uh, the court ruled that basically this was political speech. It was not about um, just trying to get into a fight for, for fun. Um, flag burning, a little bit about flag burning. Uh, case to know, Texas v. Johnson, 1989. Um, the court rules that this is um, constitutional, constitutional expression. Um, and symbolic speech. Um, now, a couple things to note. One, uh, this continues to be controversial. There's regularly um, legislation that is introduced in uh, Congress to uh, amend the Constitution to prohibit this. Um, and two, I wouldn't advise you burning a, a flag uh, just because it's been found to be constitutional. Because that means you got to, you know, you, you might be prosecuted. You got to do. You do you really want to fight it all the way to the Supreme Court? But um, and and there, like anything else, there are limits, right? So if you set your neighbor's house on fire because you uh, burned a flag, yeah, you're liable for damage. So there are limits on all, all these speeches. Um, the um, restrictions on speech um, that are the body that is that is um, supported 
in legal terms for making restrictions on speech is the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. It doesn't censor speech, but it can impose fines um, by virtue of its role as a regulator, right? Um, so it has done that in, broad, in cases of broadcasts, um, wardrobe malfunctions and all that sort of jazz. Um, in the case of the internet, it is, it's more or less wide open. There have been attempts to regulate the internet. Those attempts have not really borne fruit. They've been found unconstitutional. Um, the Supreme Court in Reno versus ACLU in 97 uh, ruled that Congress's attempt to, um, to put limits on the internet through the Communications Decency Act that was unconstitutional. So we have these FCC principles of open internet that are established in 2005. Um, freedom of assembly, again, grouped under First Amendment. The um, government can put restrictions on the time, the place, the manner of a protest or an assembly, um, but the content is cannot be censored, right? And all restrictions have to be applied even-handedly. Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, many are very familiar with it. You might not be so familiar with the fact that this, um, that the court has over time changed its opinion of this uh, freedom considerably. That in the in the 19th century, that this was not something that came up hardly at all. And when it did come up, the court, in some cases, was quite restrictive of um, gun rights. Um, took a very restrictive view of, of gun rights. That was more or less the case for decades, the rights of individuals to hold guns of various caliber and capacity. Um, this shifts beginning uh, really about in the 70s. We start to, have to see a shift. Um, and the Supreme Court now has um, issued decisions that are more permissive about gun ownership. Um, again, this is not a this is not a constitutional law case, but um, there are with all these liberties we have to consider how does the civil liberty balance with other liberties? Um, so you have a right to for example, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, how is that affected by other people's exercise of a civil liberty? Um, is your um, life endangered by people, um, you know, by unrestricted gun use? Um, these are the questions that come to play when we, when we consider the Second Amendment. Um, the, another key element of the Bill of Rights is the, the, are the amendments that establish the rights of the accused. Um, this proportion, the proportion of people who are accused and convicted in the last, um, in, in the last four decades has increased um, about five times. So it's, this is really um, increasingly important. Um, set of civil liberties. It is a set, right, because we're talking about several uh, several amendments. Fourth Amendment prohibits, um, well, basically uh, puts restrictions on uh, search and seizure, right? It says you need to have a warrant. Um, there needs to be evidence that a, a crime has occurred. You can't, this, the police just can't go on fishing expeditions. Um, in Map versus Ohio, this is one of those cases that you need to, to know. We have the establishment of the exclusionary rule. The exclusionary rule says that uh, evidence that is seized illegally can't be used at trial. It's a way of taking away the incentive to even engage in a search that may be illegal. The Fifth Amendment establishes rights of trials, establishes the uh, grand jury. You might say, well, what the what is the point of having a grand jury? Well, the point is that it makes it so the prosecutor cannot just decide, or some, the government cannot just decide, well, we're going to prosecute this guy for this or that. The, the, the evidence of that 
crime has got to be presented to a set of citizens chosen at random um, who will then judge the evidence and say, well, it, is this something that, that, uh, that an indictment can be made, should be made? Um, we also have within this uh, Fifth Amendment that the um, people have to be informed of their rights, right? So this is the so-called Miranda warnings. You're all familiar with that through watching uh, Law and Order reruns. Um, you know, you have a right to attorney. You have the right to be quiet. Um, if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided to you. Um, the death penalty. More controversy. Um, the death penalty, some people said it should be prohibited because the Eighth Amendment prohibits the use of cruel and unusual punishment. Um, so for some, for a, a couple of years, it was in fact prohibited under that. Um, it's, it is in use in the United States, but by increasingly, uh, small number of um, states and localities. Um, worldwide, the only industrialized nations that are using it are the US and Japan. If we look around the globe, um, you know, the US is in the company of China. China is the lead execution. And then we have, we have Saudi Arabia, we have um, Iran, you know, um, but you don't see what don't you don't see any countries in no countries in, in Europe not not Russia not Australia not South America you know these are these are places that have done away with the death penalty uh, the case where that uh, led to the death penalty being outlawed in the United States for a period was Furman versus Georgia in 1972 um, this was it was struck down the death penalty was struck down one because of its being um, cruel and unusual, but there were other reasons too, right? Um, one is that it was being imposed freakishly, as, as one justice put it. In other words, very arbitrarily. And there was an in, there was a, a question about whether it was racial bias, and this is this continues to be a concern. The case that brings back the death penalty is Greg versus Georgia. This is the guy who was sentenced to death for murder. Ironically, he got out, he escaped uh, from death row the night before his execution. I guess there's high motivation there. Made it all the way to North Carolina. They got into a bar fight and was killed that night in the bar fight. So uh, somewhere there, there's a moral. Don't get into bar fights, uh, especially uh, if you just got out of prison. Um, so now there are some limits on the death penalty the limits put are put on uh, by the supreme court but uh, more of the limits are happening at the state level that uh, more and more states are just saying this we cannot be sure that this is uh, this can be applied fairly and um that we can't be sure that that um, innocent people aren't being put to death this is in recent years, this is um, the reason that um, Illinois did away with, it, with its death penalty. There was an investigation that started that they found that there was an unconscionable number of people on death row who were in fact found to be innocent when there was DNA testing done that, that, that they had been, confessions had been forced out of them or they were put on death row and shoddy uh, evidence. So fewer um, a, a dwindling number of states actually are using the death penalty. Uh, the, the, the racial aspect is, is very key, too. We have a high number of studies that have found that um, race is a factor when the death penalty is imposed, that uh, African Americans are much more likely to have the death penalty imposed upon them. And, uh, you know, if you, if you look at some of the the graphs that show, you know, how often is a uh, a death penalty imposed? It's many people think that there's uh, sufficient evidence to think there's a racial component here. Um, so, U.S. is one of those um, countries still imposing the death penalty. Um, Sixth Amendment right to counsel. This is very important. This uh, Gideon B. Wainwright, one of those cases you do need to know about. 
um, Gideon was um, sent to prison for, he was more or less a, you know, a, uh, a minor criminal, but um, he was, you know, I think it, he was arrested for breaking and entering, something like that, and uh, he could not afford an attorney. When he was in prison, he um, petitioned the Supreme Court, you know, read up on, on the law, and su successfully petitioned the Supreme Court, and in fact, um, they heard his case, and, and uh, because of him, hundreds and hundreds of other defendants had their cases reviewed because they also had had their um, constitutional right to an attorney um, ignored. Um, civil liberties in this modern era, one of the things that that, um, that perhaps the civil liberties are, are more um, uh, in question about is the restriction on terrorism. This is something that a continuing um, case of, of, of uh, controversy. So the Patriot Act was law passed by Congress to protect the nation. And it, it to some extent, there were um, more of a free hand was given to law enforcement. People concerned with civil liberties wonder, what is this, was this really necessary? And um, are we really protecting um, the nation by doing away with people's liberties? So, um, in conclusion, remember that this is always a balancing act. This is a case of always a continuing story um, that there are social norms that change and that um, the court's interpretation of civil liberties that are owed to people changes as society itself changes.